Can you want to stand over here? Oh, yeah. Zoom okay. 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 Okay, thank you very much for being here. And uh, next week is spring break, but uh, you know, this Friday, most people are already gone, but I really appreciate you come here. And this is such nice talk. So Jimmy, Jimmy has more than 25 years uh, experience uh, for the cutting edge artificial intelligence system. And he, he's located in California, so he knows all the new things about AR startups and many other things. So actually, he has co-founded several companies, including, you know, um, including a church and Duncan Group. I, I know that one back, I, I know him for more than 10 years or something. Um, it's a boutique consultancy company in large scale AI, which he runs in San Francisco. And he also doing other things um, about uh, another company called RTB Fast. It's a real time bidding en engine infrastructure play for digital advertising system. And Document Souls, oh, that's a nice name. Uh, it's a document centric anticipatory information system. So since 2012, he went in house as a senior VP of data science and chief scientist at Native X. So this is a mobile and network that got acquired by Mob Vista in early 2016. In addition, uh, he had held appointment at AT&T, Turn, um, uh, Xerox uh, Research, uh, Mitsubishi Research, and, uh, and many other places. Uh, she also advised several high-tech uh, startups. Uh, uh, yeah, I will not list all the names here. So Jimmy also uh, very active in the academic uh, area. Uh, so he has been affiliated with the University of uh, California, Berkeley, and also UC, U U University of California at Santa Cruz since 2008. He actually teach uh, data science program for UC Berkeley. So it's, he also teach for us for our online course called Applied uh, Machine Learning. So it's a great pleasure. And I think um, he has many patent, 20 over pa over 20 patent and uh, anyway so it's uh, uh, so he actually um, had a PhD in engineering mathematics from University uh, of Bristol UK and hold a bachelor of science degree from University of Limerick uh, Ireland he uh, um, in 2011 he was elected as a member of Silicon Valley 50 so it means top 50 Irish Americans in technology so let's welcome Jimmy Thank you. Thank you, Ying. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, good morning to you all. And um, I guess uh, we're recording this, so I'll try to stay in front of the computer here, and hopefully people can hear me and see me and see the slides okay. So um, today I thought I'd, I'd share some ideas uh, and perspectives on deep learning and how deep learning is progressing in the field, on the front line in Silicon Valley at least. And um, some of the, uh, um, I guess, the, the challenges in deep learning have been around understanding gradient, the gradient and gradient descent. And I want to talk about some of the breakthroughs that have happened in the last six or seven years and maybe point towards the future where the next big breakthroughs will come as well. And um, as Ying uh, mentioned, I spend about 50% of my time teaching, 50% of my time running a company, and 50% of my time doing real work. And so I think it's kind of similar to you guys here. Um, and um, so let, let's get started here. So the premise here is the gradient, Nabla, is a character in a Shakespearean play. It's not a, a tragedy. Uh, the the uh, Nabla gets to prevail and uh, do real good in the end here, even though uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, pain in, in, on the way here. And so I guess, uh, let me get my slides going here. You know, who wants to be a trillionaire? Show of hands, please. Only a few of you? Wow. Not very ambitious here, huh? Okay. <laughs> anyway, according to Mark Cuban, the world's first trillionaire is going to be a person who masters AI. So are you glad you came to the talk? Maybe. Let me justify why you're here. So anyway, as uh, Ying was saying, I, I do a bunch of things, and I've been working in this field for about um, 30 years at this point. 
And so I started my career back in the late 80s in uh, Japan, working on artificial intelligence. My job title back then was AI software engineer. And what I was doing back then, I was building expert systems. And if we think about expert systems, we think about rule bases, if then else rules. And essentially, uh, we built rule based systems for uh, a bunch of applications, in, including nuclear power plants and uh, production lines for making uh, Mitsubishi motors and, and so on. And so it was a great uh, success, but it was limited because we built these rule based systems. And immediately we fell into the maintenance cycle where we had to maintain these rule bases. We had to extend them and we, set, we found ourselves perpetually uh, tinkering with the rules to make them work. And so at that point, I discovered machine learning. This is back in the uh, maybe about 1990. And I discovered a book by, written by um, uh, McKellen and et al. on neural networks. And uh, that book had a floppy disk in there with some implementations of back propagation. And so I took that and we tinkered around and we started to do some machine learning. And so anyway, that began my affair with uh, machine learning and, and, and neural networks that was kind of uh, on and off over the last 30 years. I have, I have, I'm happy to report that it's on again with deep learning and, and, and neural networks. And so anyway, um, I, I'd like to uh, kind of organize today's talk as follows. We'll start with a little prologue about kind of what, why are we here? And then um, I want to take you through the different eras that um, deep learning has gone through over the last, say, couple of hundred years. And uh, it's a five-act play here. And uh, in the first act here, we found ourselves tinkering around with machine learning. We moved away from the principles of linear regression and statistics and moved into the mode of hacking it up. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we entered the golden era of uh, a gradient descent and back propagation and chain rule basically calculus um, and that was like around 1970s 995 and so we saw a lot of great progress then and then we hit a wall and so uh, um, then in act three we kind of uh, enter a medieval pastime of training neural networks we'll talk more about that um, and about 2007 to 2010 11 time frame we found ourselves thinking what are we doing here we got into an introspection mode and uh, we uh, um, took a step back and started to understand better what's going on. And then uh, that opened the floodgates of amazing progress over the last five years. And so the last five or six years have been like dog years um, in terms of progress in uh, deep learning and, and so on. So if you think about a dog, a dog typically lives about 10 years on average. And so five years in a dog's life is a, is a pretty uh, a formidable uh, time period. And so Act 5 here is focusing on the, the latest developments in deep learning, or some of the latest developments, and um, they have propelled uh, deep learning into an even higher level of performance. And I, I want to kind of maybe then uh, hit the brakes and talk about a paper that was published uh, a few days ago um, that uh, might uh, shed some light about where we are. Because if you work in deep learning, who works in deep learning here? Couple of you, okay, okay, nice. Um, so if you, work, if you work in deep learning, then um, um, I, I guess um, this, this paper might resonate with you. And um, you'll also appreciate that deep learning is an empirical sport. It's all about doing experiments and hacking things up, see what happens. It's about creating circuits, wiring circuit diagrams basically, which are neural network architectures. And, and then trying things out, uh, experiment, uh, and see what happens. And that's kind of where we're at today. And this paper that I allude to, uh, which I'll talk about later, uh, is basically saying, hey, let's kind of have a closer look here. Let's do kind of a success failure analysis of these latest architectures and see what is going on. And so it's a kind of deep dive analysis of what's happening and using a few tools to help understand what's happening under the covers. And so what they have uh, opened up there is uh, a bunch of uh, insights and challenges, and that's it. So we're at a kind of a, I think at a, a, an interesting juncture where some breakthroughs will kind of happen maybe in the next, maybe, who knows, 12 to 18 months uh, along these lines. So I'll, 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 I'll get to this during the kind of Act 5 epilogue time frame here. So 
anyway, uh, so here's the cast of characters for today's presentation. So Nabla is going to play uh, the, the role of the gradient himself, and then we've got this idea of a neuron. We've got auto differentiation. It's a way of doing calculus uh, automatically, auto automatically. And then we've got a whole bunch of supporting uh, concepts such as loss functions, gradient descent, uh, atom, uh, and various, uh, various things like that. And so we have the, the network itself. So we've got all these extra guys here, producers, that have done amazing things to move the field along over the last 70 or 80 years. Maybe some of these guys will recognize. And uh, uh, I, I guess uh, this guy here, Alex Krychetsky from, um, he now works at Google, and uh, uh, he, he had a major breakthrough in 2012 here, but he uh, is pretty much hanging out here in the background here compared to all these guys, all these big names here. So anyway, um, um, we also have a, a big supporting uh, ecosystem today that comes from various software companies and hardware companies that you may recognize here. So we have the likes of TensorFlow, Keras, MXNet, we've got uh, NVIDIA, uh, we've got Intel. So there's kind of hardware, software interplay here that's really starting to shape up here. So in the last two or three years, we're starting to define uh, and, and, and build hardware that's, that's built, purposefully built for doing um, um, machine learning, deep learning type activities. And so if we think about a, a, a neural network, we think of this uh, simple architecture on the left here, uh, which is uh, a single layer neural network where we have four classes of prediction here. And we've got about five inputs and we've got this hidden layer. And so deep learning is about saying, hey, why don't we have more um, layers in between the inputs and the outputs? And so when we do this, we, we start to open up a whole uh, Pandora's box of potential architectures. So I don't expect you to be able to read this, it's not an eye test, but um, what we have here is uh, a different types of network architectures that have been concocted over the last, say, 30 or 40 years. And we, steep, we still keep reinventing and inventing new architectures, as we shall see uh, shortly. So some of these new architectures are, are kind of down here where we, we kind of, um, we're starting to do more interesting things with uh, with the connectivity between uh, neurons and, uh, and, and so on. So um, normally I teach a course on deep learning. I've, I teach this course in a number of different places. Um, and I have a, have a consultancy that I run in San Francisco around uh, big data, big data pipelines and, and machine learning, deep learning and so on. And so typically uh, we have about a 60 hour course that we give on this topic alone. So you're getting a 60 minutes version of it here. So we're, we're kind of compressing at a, uh, a big, big rate here. Um, so we're about 2% compression rate here. So uh, forgive me if this goes too fast, but if you are interested in a more in-depth um, treatment of this uh, topic, please reach out and, and contact me. And so we typically focus a lot on, on theory here uh, and get you up to speed on that front first because there's a lot of uh, core theory that's important to understand first and then show the kind of the evolution into what has come, become deep learning today. And there's lots of applications which are really interesting and, and powerful, and, uh, and they really go way beyond our rule-based systems that we just talked about previously. And so um, our goal here is to take some training data and uh, apply machine learning algorithms to, to the data, analyze the errors that we get. And, 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 uh, and so when we think about AI, uh, we, we've gone through, I think, four cycles, hype cycles of, of AI so far. And we're currently in the midst of another cycle of, uh, of hype for AI. And um, I don't know, I've actually lived through a co couple of winters of AI. I think some of you here have also lived through uh, one or two winters. And, uh, and, and it ain't as bad as the, the winters here in Indiana, I think. Uh, it, it, was, it was pretty bad uh, back in the uh, early 90s and, and 2000s uh, and so on. So, but anyway, I think the difference today is that this hype cycle here is pretty much different because previously when we talked about AI, it was very much like Hollywood-esque in nature. A lot of the grant proposals were like uh, uh, movies that people wanted to kind of say, hey, let's go create this future science fiction and so on. Whereas today, a lot of, uh, of what's being done and, and delivered and proposed is actually uh, uh, concrete applications. So we're showing how things are being used and and deployed, and so if, who, who's got a smartphone here? I guess most of you have a smartphones. Well, those smartphones are all loaded up with some great AI applications from speech recognition to image classification and, and, and video um, um, transcriptions and, and so on. 
And so, uh, so AI is, is pretty much touching all of what we do here. And it's delivering some great results, I think. And so that's a kind of a testament to where we are in this hype cycle, I think. So it's pretty positive. So, you know, my inspirations for this talk come from a whole bunch of research. And I highlight some papers here, which I think were pivotal uh, in kind of propelling us forward in this area of deep learning. So again, I'll, I'll send the slides around later. But for now, um, you can see the time span here goes from 1943 all the way up to uh, actually 2018 at this point. Um, and so, um, and so when, we, when it comes to machine learning, uh, in the old days, we spent a lot of time uh, taking uh, input data and trying to model that input data. We could say, it could be a simple model of saying, hey, is there a car in this image, yes or no? And um, we would spend a lot of time doing feature engineering, and then we would learn a classifier, and, and, and then do a, a, a apply to data. Today, however, we can actually stuff the idea of feature engineering inside the uh, deep learning uh, module here, where we start to um, do feature extraction and modeling in, in the same pipeline. And uh, as such, uh, as uh, data scientists, we spend our time doing architecture engineering, which we'll elaborate uh, shortly on. So fabulous applications, speech recognition. Um, we've got um, today, we're, we're making, uh, we're, uh, I've got an error rate of about uh, 5%. So let's say one in 15 to 20 words, we make a mistake in speech recognition. And uh, um, image classification, I think we got this nailed down. Anybody watch H the HBO series, uh, Silicon Valley? Somebody? Some okay, so you recognize this guy here. He's, uh, he's kind of uh, epitomizes the progress we've made in image uh, understanding, and he's got this uh, app or a hot dog or not uh, that he developed uh, in, in this uh, uh, show called Silicon Valley. And so I got to meet this guy earlier this year at the Golden Globes. Uh, he's an interesting guy to talk with. Um, so have you heard about deep fakes? Uh, so basically, you can get anybody, you can take a video of anybody, a video of me, for example, and, um, uh, and make me say anything. And it'll be very hard for you to detect, is this a real or is it fake? And here's Barack Obama. I won't go through the sound clip here, but you can do that later yourselves. And so I guess uh, Nicolas Cage, is a, he's a guy, he's a very versatile actor, and uh, uh, using the deep fake technology, Nicholas can play any role from male to female, young to old. He's a very versatile actor, and uh, I encourage you to get out there and see what the meme of Nicholas Cage is all about. We've done a great job about object recognition. We can localize in images where people are, things are at, um, translation, um, and we can play games better than anybody else. So if you wanted to understand what does $500 million look like, then you can look at this uh, Google acquisition of DeepMind in 2014, where their big claim to fame was uh, they learned how to play computer games using reinforcement learning, in deep reinforcement learning, and uh, got $500 million for that. So we've got a course for display, and the course is uh, uh, what's the gradient for linear regression? So basically the course is, uh, the gradient is the weighted sum of the training data where the weights are proportional to the error for each example. I'm not sure if this is how you've seen the gradient previously, but uh, this is kind of how NABLA wants to be uh, remember, remember this. And so um, here we've got um, a weight vector associated with our linear regression model, and we want to uh, update this weight vector here using the gradients. We've got a learning rate here, and we've got an error which says, hey, I made a mistake in my prediction. So this is my output from the network, or from the, uh, the regression model, and here's my target value, and there's a small difference, and then I say, oh, go, go ahead and weight that example by this error. So if, if I'm off by five, then I multiply my example by five, and I, I'll, I'll kind of uh, subtract five times that example to so give me an update for the, for the weight vector. And so it doesn't matter where I start, I'll end up in a pretty good place. And so this is a, a simple gradient descent for linear regression, and it's a similar principle for uh, neural networks. So, and you know, um, you know, in, in school, I guess, or in, in kindergarten maybe, you learned about the equation of the line. Y is equal to mx plus b. Is that the case? Yeah? Is that, okay, so, so basically, you're trying to tweak the slope here of the line, and, and you're trying to tweak how far the origin is from the, from, the, uh, from the line. So you've got two parameters, n and b here, and we spend our time figuring out 
which combination of MMD actually makes sense to fit a, a data cloud. And so we can take a set of data here and we can fit different lines. And so the question is which line is better? And we have this notion of error. And, uh, uh, and so we get feedback on each uh, example and how good we predict it. And so that error becomes our weighting factor in the gradient calculation for uh, updating. And so typically we'll visualize our, our, our problem here in terms of a, a model space. Um, this is our model space here. This is our input variable x. This is our target value y. This is a cloud of data. And here's our current estimate for a line. Clearly this line is not very good. And so over here we've got this parallel universe where we say this is my intercept space and this is my slope for y is equal to mx plus b. So I'll take different combinations of intercept and slope here. And when I take this point here, I get, a, I get a line like this. So clearly, I can pick any point in the space of intercept and slope, and it'll result in a line over here. And hopefully, I'll be able to locate the line that's actually a good fit for the data. And so you can imagine writing two for loops. Who's a programmer here? You're all capable of writing for loops. So if you do two for loops here, you can say, I'm going to actually explore the different values of intercept and slope. And I'm going to um, compute the mean squared error for each uh, combination. And when I do this, I can reconstruct the surface over here. This is my mean squared error surface. And as you can see here, this is not just a flat surface. There's a, there's a valley in here, and there's a low point in here. And so my goal in machine learning is to get to this low point as quickly as possible. Now, this idea of having a two-loop enumeration cycle is uh, that's, that's fine and, and, and works well for small problems, but when I go to larger scale problems, it doesn't scale very well. And so I want a smarter way to do things, and we can then reach out to optimization theory to get there. And in optimization theory, we have this thing called a gradient, uh, a gradient compass. And that allows me to navigate a, a mountain like Mount Fuji, uh, which is uh, akin to my mean squared error surface, turned upside down. And I can navigate this surface in a very smart way. And I don't have to recompute all, all this surface. All I got to do is uh, compute various points on the way here. So I use the gradient compass as a means to navigate this uh, surface. And uh, all, all, all is good. So we can solve a variety of tasks from classification to regression. Um, we learn from supervised data. People uh, label data all the time for us. So who's got an iPhone 10 or an iPhone X, I guess I should say. Okay, only a few brave souls here. Okay, well, um, this is an amazing uh, uh, phone because you can look at it and it'll recognize you. And uh, it's awesome because, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm in different lighting conditions. Sometimes it's dark when I'm looking at the phone, it doesn't recognize me. And then it says, hey, you got a punch in your pin number. Well, that's another training example for this machine here. Because uh, I made a, it made a mistake and I'm going to correct it and I get to give uh, say hey This is a solid ground truth or solid feedback here. It takes that solid feedback and revises itself So maybe after ten times it'll recognize me in the dark uh, So um, so it's a great way of getting labeled data is, is the bottom line here and so we um, We've got lots of different machine learning approaches that we put out there and I'm just going to uh, I won't bore you with all the details here, but you know, think of this as a, 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 as a simple linear regression model where we've got four input features and we've got our uh, output uh, coming out here. It's a weighted sum of our inputs. So I think you're all familiar with linear regression. And so then you can say, hey, you know what? Um, let, let me um, make this more complicated. Let me not have just a single output here. Let me have a multi-level uh, uh, output here where maybe I'm doing classification. And I want to classify this input object into three different classes. And so therefore, I got these three uh, weighted uh, nodes here. And we call these neurons. And so um, I, I can then say, uh, well, let me just uh, insert uh, another layer of neurons here. Um, and so before I know it, I go from a very simple uh, shallow type arrangement here to a deeper arrangement where I've got multiple intermediate layers. And here I go from shallow network to deep network. And this is my uh, deep um, network. Um, so, and so at, at the end of the day, uh, we're just using um, gradient descent to get there. So let, let's kind of go to act one here, now that we're all kind of caught up in, in kind of the core principles of what we're going to use here. So act one, um, we, we were just kind of uh, um, looking at uh, artificial intelligence and saying, you know, one facet of artificial intelligence is learning. Um, 
can we have a, a crack at that whole idea? And um, oh, by the way, I don't know any statistics. I've never seen really linear regression before. Let me just kind of think of a new algorithm that might be able to solve a problem for separating one class of object from another. And so back in uh, 40, 1943, Michael Pitts came up with this perceptron uh, idea, this kind of neuron uh, that we just talked about. Uh, think of it as a linear regression model, um, but more for classification purposes. Sorry? Uh, yeah, he came up with the algorithm, like the training algorithm, actually. That was, so yeah. Perceptron is just the kind of the concept. Uh, and so then um, Rosenblatt came up with a, with a learning algorithm that allowed us to tweak um, and, and, and learn the weights associated with that model. And he did this actually in hardware. And um, um, so this is kind of the first perceptron machine here. And so this was used for uh, recognizing images, basically. And this was back in 1950s, late 50s. And um, you know, th this uh, whole idea of learning a perceptron model um, was uh, basically hack it up. Uh, it, it was uh, something that these guys came up with. They didn't have um, gradient descent. They didn't have optimization theory training. And so there were no principles going on there. It was pretty much an AI hack, heuristic-based approach to, to learning. And so um, um, let me, uh, if we had more time, I would explain this little Mona Lisa here to you, but. So basically, um, then um, you know, people took the perceptron and said, "Hey, why don't we have multiple perceptrons together?" And we then they called it uh, eight line, nine line, and uh, and so at that point, uh, people thought, "Oh my God, this is this is really going to be awesome. This is going to be big." This is back in the late '50s, early '60s, and so um, we, we lacked theory. We didn't know what we were doing. We we're just having a heuristic-based approach to doing some modeling. And so uh, around 1969 people said, uh, started to look at uh, some of the problems with uh, the perceptron algorithm. And uh, Minsky and Papert wrote a book on this, criticizing it, saying, hey, this uh, little algorithm can't even solve this, the, 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 the smallest of problems, the exclusive R problem. And so that was the first kind of kiss of death of, uh, of, of, of perceptron learning. And, but people said, okay, well, that's a problem. Uh, let's kind of uh, explore where is the problem and can we bring some theory to, to bear on this? And so people started to look at optimization theory and they start to look at the chain rule who has studied the chain rule recently or used the chain rule recently what <laughs> we should be using this every day now it's uh, so the chain rule is like just uh, something from calculus and so the idea is very simple and so uh, it uh, allowed us to actually come up with uh, a more principled way to um, to train a network like this. We've got a multi-layer perceptron and we're just using the chain rule to kind of unpack uh, each of these weights here and figure out how to tweak these weights in order to make this network perform even better. And, um, and so we, we basically what we have here is we can think of each uh, node in this network here as a perceptron as or a neuron. And, uh, and we can think of this neuron as being kind of a, um, splitting our space into two half spaces. We got a hyperplane basically. And, uh, and so each little neuron has its own little fiefdom. And, uh, and so then we can take the output of a neuron and say, hey, um, you know, uh, neurons fire or get excited when, they're, when their fiefdom gets activated. And, uh, and so we've got different ways of taking that firing and that signal. And, and, uh, and so um, we can think of a neural network function like this. This is, a, uh, this is our input here, hidden layer output. And we can just write this down and mathematically like this as a, a function f of this, of this. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, a way of sums. And so back in 1986, um, Roman Hart and McKellen and et al, they published, uh, uh, and Hinton, they published a paper that looks like this. So this paper maybe I'm not sure if it's visible, but it is a gradient descent. It's just basically calculus using chain rule. And uh, we, we got to understand how we model um, uh, networks um, and, 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 and solve uh, networks in a principled manner. And so we, we ended up getting the back propagation and we saw that uh, in back propagation, uh, gradient is, is, is super important. And now our, our chorus, um, has switched up like this. So it's still the fundamental chorus of saying, look, your training data gets to play a big role in updating the weights of this network. And they are in proportion to the error that the network makes on a particular example. 
And that error, it gets propagated back through the network. And so, we, so the error can be, a, it can be the direct error from the output layer, or it can be some proxy that we kind of uh, pass in. Uh, and so this is kind of a little animation here about uh, taking the error uh, associated with, a, with a, the network here. So we make a prediction, we make an error, and then we pass that little signal back. And uh, we give each node a, a little bit of credit assignment. Um, and saying, hey, you were responsible for this error. Let me update the, the weights associated with you to make you better next time around. And so, OK, so let's move on to Act 3 here very briefly and talk about um, you know, the next phase in deep learning. And so I, I refer to this as kind of the dark ages of deep learning. And so between 1995 and 2007, we have, I guess, two lost decades of, of, of progress there. Um, so it was only the hardcore that stuck with it during this two, two decades. And so we had people like uh, Jeffrey Hinton, Jan LeCun, and, and, and a few others, not too many others, that kind of said, hey, we can get this neural network thing to work. Uh, we're going to stick with it. And, but I, and you'll see the, how brave these guys were, because they were trying to do some amazing things with, uh, with really mediocre hardware and, uh, uh, and kind of ideas. And, and so, so again, we're back in the kind of hacking it up phase and just survival, just trying to get things done. And, um, and so, so we, get into, we get into this medieval pastime of training neural networks. And um, so I guess people start to identify, uh, you know, if we have a neural network and if the network is too big, too many hidden nodes or too many hidden layers, we run into problems. And so the biggest problem was that the gradient signal. So when we make a mistake, uh, we measure the mistake, we measure our uh, predicted input with our expected, uh, sorry, predicted output, with our expected output, and there's an error. So that's a, that error is a signal that we want to pass back through the network in order to update different weights. And so it turns out that uh, signal uh, gets to uh, gets to die very quickly. We go through many layers of networks. We'll look at, it, look at this in a moment here. So anyway, uh, people start to understand that the gradient is, is, is awesome, but uh, it doesn't live forever when we, when we propagate it back through the network. And so people start to uh, figure out, well, that's our problem. How do we come up with a cheap hack to fix that problem? And so uh, people wanted to train, uh, they wanted to train deeper networks. They recognized that even though there were nice and wonderful theorems of neural networks being universal functional approximators, and, 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 and in that theorem, uh, it stated that all you needed was a single layer, hidden layer, and you could approximate any function in the world. And uh, that, that kind of theory didn't really work in practice. And so these guys were like, okay, well, we need to actually get some more layers in here. And when we do this, we see that we can make progress. And so they started to look at autoencoders as a way to get to, um, to train networks. And I'll show you in a moment how they start to do this. So think of autoencoders as sort of a, a principal components analysis, where we try to embed our data in a new space. And then uh, in, the, and in the new space, we try to recover the original data. And so um, I hope I have an image here. So here's, here's kind of the idea. So I've got my original input here. It's an image. And then I want to basically pass it through uh, um, uh, an encoder, think of these as principal components, and then I want to deco decode out the other side here. So I want, to, I want to basically reconstruct my input after transforming it through this uh, weight layer here. And so I'm going to take this idea of autoencoder, and I'm going to train uh, a multi-layer network. So think of this as my uh, unlabeled data here. And let's start over here. So I've got labeled data over here. I pass it through my input layer, got a hidden layers, and then I've got an output prediction layer. And so my goal is to train the weights associated with this hidden layer, the weights associated with this hidden layer, and the weights associated with this layer. So if I try to do this in one go back then, um, I, I would actually run into problems. I would not be able to learn because um, I would get my, I would make predictions in a forward um, propagation manner here. I would get my predictions here, measure my predictions versus my target or expected values, or actual values, and I would get an error. I would take the error signal here, and the error signal will be great for updating the weights associated with hidden, this hidden layer here, uh, or sorry, this output layer. Uh, but then uh, by the time this uh, signal would get back to, say, 
the hidden the weights associated with hidden layer number one, they would be gone to zeros. And I'll maybe show you uh, momentarily what that all means concretely. So, so they recognized, okay, well, we can train a network using backpropagation in, in, a, in, a, in a situation like this. So let's try to be creative here and let's try to figure out an alternative strategy. So we get into this kind of amazing uh, workload here, a workflow, where we say, look, why don't we just take the, our uh, unlabeled data and let's try to reproduce the, 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 the input uh, using an autoencoder. So think of this as kind of saying, I want to do a principal components analysis and I want to get a new, I want to embed my data in a new space, this kind of whatever, if, if let's say I have 10 nodes in my, in, my, in my hidden layer here and I want to embed my data in this 10 node space and then I want to reproduce it here and I'm going to try to faithfully reproduce. And so that's how I train my first layer. The next layer I say, okay, fine, you've come this far, lock it down. Take your data, pass it through here, produce the activations by uh, associated with this layer here and use these as input. And again, try to re reproduce these inputs uh, out here in, in the output layer. And so we train another hidden layer. And so we repeat this process for all hidden layers. And then suddenly we have, um, so I guess <clears throat> there were two kind of things that people noticed here. First thing is that the gradient was dying. There's no way we get the gradient back through all these three layers here. And then people recognize, oh my God, uh, initialization is also a little problem too. So normally if you have a, a linear regression model, you might initialize it to a bunch of zeros maybe, or a bunch of random numbers. And this is what people were doing back then. So, um, so people were hacking it up and saying, oh, let's just initialize to uh, a bunch of random numbers. So now after this kind of autoencoding based training of the hidden layers, we've got some great um, uh, weights to kind of initialize our network. At this point here, we might take the backprop algorithm and try to refine the weights associated with this layer here and maybe this layer here optimistically. So, so now you can see that my medieval pastime is all about saying, look, take the unlabeled data, try to reproduce uh, the data using um, autoencoder-based uh, training algorithms. And I do this uh, repeatedly. And uh, lo and behold, this actually worked pretty well. And so this is what people came up with back in 2006 after two decades of slaving around in the trenches. And then that was kind of the, 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 the fashion for training networks for about four or five years. So we see all sorts of people uh, using this uh, type of uh, um, um, training strategy for speech recognition systems, for image classification, uh, and so on. So this is a paper by uh, Andrew Ning and, and, and his students at Stanford, and this was in 2009, ICML 2009, where they trained um, a multi-layered neural network here, uh, it's a convolutional neural network, using this whole strategy, strategy of a layer-by-layer-based layer -layer -based, uh, training um, of the, the network. And so, we're starting to make progress here. We're starting to get some really good results at this point, but it's kind of, uh, it's really uh, tough going. It's a lot of work and uh, you're really hoping that you converge in a model that's going to be pretty useful. Uh, and so, and, and generally there were some good applications that came out of here, um, but people weren't happy with this medieval pastime. And so we get into act four here, which was more of a, a period of in introspection and saying, hey, this is great, we've got some things working, but what are we really doing under the covers here? What's kind of, can we just kind of do a deeper dive and try, try to understand what's going on? So back in uh, 2010, Javier Gloritz and Yoshio Benjo, they, they, um, they did a kind of a very deep introspection type uh, paper uh, called Understanding the Difficulty of Training Deep Forward Neural Networks. So I think the title kind of captures the whole uh, goal of the paper and uh, and so basically they take us they took a step back at what we were doing and try to understand it from a, a kind of a, um, a principled um, perspective and so um, first of all they kind of said okay well we've got these activation functions here which are basically saying I'm a neuron I'm excited because something has happened and now I want to maybe temper your excitement here by passing that excitement through a sigmoid function. So I want to go from uh, uh, kind of a, a super high value to uh, kind of a, a value between um, um, zero and one basically. 
And uh, so basically this is kind of a, an activation function that kind of tempers my excitement. And there were multiple uh, or different types of activation functions that people used over the years, sigmoid, tanch. And uh, people start to uh, look at this, uh, th these functions here and saying, well, this guy here takes all my excitement and kind of puts it in the zone of zero, one. This guy here puts it in a minus one to plus one. So this is kind of a very lopsided kind of uh, deal here for, for, for a neuron. And this is slightly better, but uh, we shall see shortly that certain things happen uh, when you kind of have these types of activation functions. And then um, this kind of um, introspection period led to the development of alternative value functions here. So have you watched the Winter Olympics in the last few weeks? Did you watch the snowboarding, the half pipe, and the skiing, and all that stuff? And did you see people do 720s, 1140s, or whatever? So I, I think that you know, if Newton was here today, he probably would be doing, I don't know, uh, 7, 7, 720 maybe here in the grave, uh, uh, looking at these types of uh, activation functions here. Um, so basically, what we've done here is we've taken this very elaborate calculus. Uh, um, and a theory of gradient descent and backpropagation. And we've said, hey, let's dumb it down. Let's just like, you know, it's, this, is, this is wonderful math here, and we can get a nice derivative associated with this, but this is kind of like, well, we've gone from a very elaborate smooth function to this kind of piecewise linear function, and we've gone from gradient descent to subgradient descent. And so Newton might not be happy with what we've done here, but uh, I think from a practitioner's perspective, we've made a ton of progress. So, so maybe um, you know, computer science is not that bad after all. It has helped get us out of, our, out of the theoretical mind and, and into the problem-solving mode. And so let me kind of uh, relate these uh, diagrams a bit more to you uh, concretely here. So let's kind of set the scene here. So we're, we're trying to train a, a multi-layered neural network here. And so, um, so what these guys did, Javier uh, and, and Bengio, they, they kind of did a, a deep dive into a neural network. So I don't know if there are some students here today uh, who want to get a PhD or, uh, or do more research. Well, uh, this is kind of a good way to start uh, research. It's saying, hey, look, we've got a problem. Uh, let's do a deep dive and, and understand the dynamics of training a neural network. And so this is what these guys did. And uh, they kind of came up with three cases here. They said, okay, look, um, when we create a neural network, we have to initialize it with some weights. Those weights can be zeros, and then we'll spend a lot of time just spinning our wheels going nowhere initially. Or we can say, why don't we initialize them to random numbers, just any old random number, or even a small random number. Uh, and so we've got three cases here, small numbers, big numbers, and, and something else. And, um, and so they did a, a whole bunch, they set up a whole experimental framework here where they said, hey, let's go train a 10 layer neural network with 500 nodes in each layer. And let's understand uh, how uh, we go from an input layer to the output layer. And think of each hidden node or hid hidden layer pro um, producing an activation matrix or an excitement matrix that's modulated by an activation function. And so when we do this, uh, we see that um, uh, when I do an initialization, I get this kind of uh, nice spread, uh, uniform spread of uh, activations here. And so it's between, it's centered at zero and it's got a, a zero one type normal distribution here and um, close enough. And as you go across into the network at each layer, we see that our activations are getting like much more focused on zero. And so the signal is going away basically. And so if we go back to the activation function here, look, you know, this, this function here is, um, it's, it's kind of uh, at, at zero, it's kind of, uh, it starts to make uh, some interesting decisions. Um, in, in, these, in the kind of minus two to plus two, it's actually doing something useful. And otherwise, uh, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of gets saturated. And so this was kind of, uh, so one problem here is that our activations here are gone to zero pretty much uh, very quickly. And when they go to zero, and when we do gradient descent um, with say a sigmoid function, uh, the, the gradient of a sigmoid function is what? It's, uh, let's say sigmoid is S is our activation function. So S is one, S times one minus S, that's the gradient. So if your number, if your grade, if your, if, if S, S of X is, uh, let's say X is one, or then one minus S is, uh, is, is zero. So we're multiplying 
a one by a zero. So basically, th this is all fine going forward, but going backwards in back propagation, um, these numbers go to zero. And so our gradient signal goes to zero pretty quickly because uh, our activations are, are, are close to zero and um, one minus zero is, 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 is one, uh, but that's, um, and then you multiply one minus zero by one and you get zero basically. So essentially we've got a bunch of, uh, of, of uh, gradients that, um, um, that are, um, that vanish basically so quickly because the activations are really kind of saturated at one or, or zero uh, in the case of sigmoid. And so a similar problem happens when we say, look, why don't we um, um, go um, um, with some potentially bigger numbers? And, and, and so I, I won't get into the details here because I want to move on. Um, but the, the idea here is that our activations, wherever in the network, they should be um, not zero, not one. They should be kind of, they should be centered around zero. They should have a kind of a normal distribution. And, and if we kind of keep them in that space, then our network can actually make good progress. And then uh, another, another thing was that this, um, these types of activation functions here, these tanches and these sigmoids, um, the gradients of these guys here is basically, uh, the gradient of the tanch is uh, one minus tanch. And so basically, in, in gradient descent, we're kind of, uh, um, when, when the gradient becomes saturated, then, uh, sorry, when the um, activation function here becomes saturated, say, at one, um, we tend to have no gradient associated with that. So um, anyway, long story short is that by looking at the, the network and, and at the data, understanding what was happening um, and, and kind of having this kind of insight that, oh my God, the, the activation function is, first of all, is a big problem. And the second big problem is that our initialization is out of whack. We're either producing too big a number or too small a number. And so um, th this led to a kind of introduction of a more principled way for initializing networks. And, uh, and so let's just keep going here. And, and so basically uh, people um, um, got inspired by this paper. So they proposed, they did a deep analysis, they proposed some solutions, and then this opened the door uh, for uh, some amazing work in the next five years. Uh, and so, um, so, so basically, we came up with a, a bunch of new heuristics for initializing networks that work really well and have been adopted uh, throughout the industry. And so it also led to the introduction of different activation functions, which are based on these rectilinear uh, um, activation functions. So anyway, and that's, this kind of led to some amazing uh, results that caught the the public by surprise. And so we had this ImageNet thing where uh, people were starting, suddenly starting to recognize images at a great level of accuracy. So we go from uh, an error uh, rate on, in the top five of 30% of down to about 3% in the last uh, few years. So, we've, uh, so the idea of getting a, let's say, 50% uh, improvement in any performance measure is kind of, it doesn't happen every day, does it? How many times has it happened to you in a lifetime? I, I've had some big, uh, big jumps uh, here and there, but I, it only happens once kind of in any, any cycle. So, so here, these guys has an amazing drop in, in performance here from about 25% uh, down to, let's say, half that. Um, uh, and, and so, so basically, uh, this is kind of the architecture, but let's not worry on that. So bottom line here is that now we're in this kind of new era, Act 5. We're in 2015. And we think, oh my God, uh, we, we've done it all. We, we've made some great progress. Um, money's flowing in. Um, we, we've got a lot of um, great work going on. And suddenly we hit another big opportunity. And so um, people tried to start to understand that, oh my God, the, 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 we've got a network, we've got a gradient, and yeah, we better take care of the gradient. The gradient is the kind of the, the feedback signal. It's the error or it's the proxy that's going to, and, and that will feed back uh, through our network via the gradient. And, um, and people started to play around with the network and say, hey, the network is like a little circuit. I can wire this network in any way I want. And it will compute. It just will compute. Uh, and so, um, but for this to happen, uh, people start to rely on auto differentiation. And, uh, and so auto differentiation is, a, is this kind of a tool that allows us to perform uh, calculus basically automatically. 
and people started to design networks uh, in a modular fashion. And um, uh, so we got all this auto differentiation, but uh, let's take a tool like Torch or Keras or TensorFlow. Well, um, those um, systems were arc and, and piano. I should not I should not forget piano. Piano was kind of one of the original uh, systems here that's now been retired in the last year or so. Um, it was developed at uh, by Yoshio Benjo and, and others in, in the University of Montreal, and um, so they, they started to look at doing calculus in a more principled way from a deep learning perspective. And so they, they thought, okay, well, let's kind of take that network architecture that we've been talking about and let's take it a, a layer at a time. And let's take all the building components uh, that make up a network and call those uh, layers or, or uh, objects uh, that we need to um, be able to process in a forward propagation manner and also in a backward propagation manner. And so basically, when we think of these components as um, um, uh, objects that need to support an API, like basically forward prop and do differentiation on the back prop, um, then we get a very nice modular architecture that allows us to, um, to, uh, to build uh, neural networks and deep, learn, deep, deep, deep networks, and then also networks with different capabilities different activation functions, different uh, wirings of, of the network, and, and so on. And so here we have um, the Torch and, and, and Keras and TensorFlow. They all have this kind of idea that I, I'm going to have a container where I put my network. And then, oh, by the way, I'm going to have a softmax module. That's basically your logistic regression loss function. I've got a linear module, which will take a weighted sum of things. I'm going to have the dropout, which is a kind of a particular way of doing regularization and deep learning. And I've got all these activation uh, functions and layers. I've got different loss criteria. These are all kind of classes um, that are, and so if you look at um, TensorFlow or uh, Keras or any of the deep learning packages, you'll see that they're all organized in a modular fashion that allows us to, uh, to create uh, networks uh, very easily just by specifying a configuration. And we can extend them to uh, have new layers and new capabilities, new functionality very easily by just saying, hey, I got a new uh, object. I need to build a forward prop reasoner and a backward prop reasoner. And so the backward prop is basically calculus. It allows us to do auto differentiation in a very easy manner. And I won't bore you anymore with that. So here are some of the modules that people have built for, for different types of layers and different types of neurons in Torch. And this is like already two or three years old. And so the idea here is that we're, we're leveraging this reverse mode auto differentiation type uh, of capability. And, um, and this is very different to numerical differentiation. Has anybody done numerical differentiation in the last 12 months? The medi total medieval pastime, I guess, but it's uh, at least you don't, know how, you don't need to have no calculus to do that, I guess, but anyway, I don't encourage you to try that at home. But, um, okay, so, so basically, having this kind of modular way to do calculus and do auto differentiation has enabled us to kind of move away from the drudgery of taking equations, doing the calculus, coding up the calculus and the equations, and start thinking about uh, higher uh, order things such as architectures and so on. And so, um, sorry, I just my thing is moving slow here. Okay, so as a result, it allowed us to start thinking about more creative architectures. So traditionally, we kind of focused on these kind of dense uh, uh, layers that were fully connected. And then we started moving into convolutional uh, networks and convolutional kernels and so on. And, um, but with this kind of advent of this uh, auto differentiation tool, it allowed us to be a bit more aggressive in, in, in how we approach problems. And so we started to say, hey, you know, how about we, we rewire networks in a different way? Uh, let's pay attention to the gradient. The gradient is dying. Is there a way for us to get the gradient from the, the output layer all the way back to the, to the, to the, to the input layer? Uh, and, and so people started to come up with these uh, amazing things. And so we kind of have a, started to develop these kind of uh, gated um, uh, neurons. And so these are used in LSTMs and so on. And then we also came up with, uh, um, so, so we can think of, uh, so if, I don't know, this reminds me of a circuit diagram. Uh, 
and, and this is a, a neuron in a in a recurrent neural network. And and so this this network here has um, has a memory of its own, and it it kind of gets activated for certain things only. Uh, and we'll talk more about this in the context of um, ResNet here, which is a bit more easy. It's a bit easier to follow. So. If we, um, so, so here on the left here, we've got this uh, vanilla neural network. You know, it doesn't matter if it's using convolutional uh, layers or not, it doesn't matter. So it's kind of, you start at the bottom here, uh, sorry, you start here at the, uh, at the image and you kind of take the image through the network layer by layer and then you produce some output, which may be a prediction saying, hey, this image belongs to this class and you might have a thousand classes, say, a la uh, ImageNet. And so, so basically, there, so, so here we, we've got like, you know, lots of layers. So actually, it turns out that the, these guys at Microsoft, they trained up networks that were, um, the, one of the best networks was about 152 layers. 152 layers. 152. So that's a lot of layers. So, and so uh, previously, we had problems just training one layer, and suddenly we're at 152 layers. So when we train 152 layers using vanilla backprop here, uh, we don't do that well. However, if we add in these links here, so you see these little links here, these are little short circuits. So basically what we're saying is, well, here's the input, we forward prop, forward prop, and we get, I get a signal here, and then we say back prop. So the back prop says, pass that, uh, that error back through here, and oh, by the way, you can skip and go back, sorry, you can go back to here as well, and basically you're skipping certain layers, and you're short circuiting the whole process of propagating the error back. And by doing that, we actually end up um, powering up the signal for the gradient, and, and, then, and the gradient will actually come back here, not as zeros, but with some, some powered signal. So this is called ResNet, and uh, I won't get into the why it's called ResNet, but, but it, it basically, you can think of this as saying, look, why don't you just send, send your gradient signal uh, directly back um, through these uh, kind of short circuits, and, and so on. And so, that's kind of ResNet, and so ResNet had this another big, it, it kind of, um, let me show you what it did. If I can get a, a results. Uh, my computer's moving really slow. So have a look at this. So here is 2010, and so we had a 28% error in the top five classification uh, for images. And this is a big task. We've got a million, a million images. We've got a thousand categories that we want to assign images to. And then if, we, if the, uh, uh, the real category comes in the top five, we get a point, otherwise you get penalized. And so 28% of the time we're, doing, uh, we're making an error here. And, um, and so then this is 2012 with a, a deeper network, eight layers. And then over here in 2015, we have 152 layers. So we've got 152 layers here. And, um, and so basically, we've gone from a very uh, simple net network over here to a very complex thing. And we've gone from 30% uh, error to 3% error here. And so it, it all comes from paying attention to the gradient. And, and so let's, um, I, maybe I've got maybe five minutes to go here. And I want to show you, um, One thing. So in a slide, kind of this is what's happening. So this is kind of Alex Ness and, and BGG about 2012, 2013. We had this kind of uh, take an image, pass it through a network in a very traditional fashion. Then in 2014, 15, Google started playing around with kind of little short circuits. So this is a bit more complicated of a circuit diagram for this network. And then in 2015, we have this idea of, of kind of a more elaborate circuit. Uh, so we're short-circuiting the, uh, the, the gradient here. And then in 2017, people said, hey, you know, we don't need to just kind of have this kind of uh, architecture here. Look, why don't we just do whatever we like here? Let's put, put arcs wherever we want. So basically we're saying, let's just kind of think of this network as a circuit that we can connect uh, any layer to any other layer we like. And uh, because we have auto differentiation, we don't have to worry about gradients and calculations and errors and so on. Um, and so when we do this kind of dense, this is called a dense network. And, um, and these are kind of called highway links or they're called skip, uh, skip links, skip connections. 
And so basically you can see that we're passing a signal from here all the way through, but then we're also saying, hey, send the signal to this guy, uh, to this, this layer, this layer. Uh, so we're skipping around here with the, with, the, with, the, uh, um, with the connections. And so this works really well in, in practice. And so here's where we're at. So people are trying to understand what is this uh, dense network or these skip connections, what are they bringing to the, to the game here? And so, uh, so for a while, people were like, okay, well, it seems that, you know, first of all, the number of parameters goes way down when we have these skip connections. And then the computational uh, effort required is also a lot less. This is kind of uh, um, the, the computational effort. You can see this blue curve here is our dense network. So it's about half. And, uh, and so, uh, and, and, the, and the accuracy or the errors, uh, they're all kind of about the same ballpark. So we're getting a lot more bang for our buck here because these uh, ResNet would take weeks to train, a couple of weeks to train. And, um, and, and then this, this type of model here would take maybe half that. Um, and so, so people were very excited and said, okay, this is great. And in, in addition, uh, these types of networks give about, you know, uh, you know, five or 10% improvement in error over uh, the more traditional networks, uh, which was a big improvement uh, back in 2015 timeframe. So, so where we're at today is people uh, use these uh, ResNet and dense networks and skip connections a lot to, to really uh, to solve problems. And um, it's only in the last couple of days, but this is March 4, 2018, this paper was published. And so this paper here is kind of interesting because they said, okay, well, we want to understand what is going on here. What are, what are these skip connections doing for us? What are they bringing to the table? And so here's what they came up with. They, they said, okay, look, um, you know, singularities, uh, matrices, uh, you know, this, uh, our networks are just basically matrices. And so if our matrices become singular in nature, then we fail to make progress. And so if we look more closely here, um, we see that sometimes our weights here uh, in, in, a, in a particular layer for this, for this hidden layer here go to zero. And so when they go to zero, we can't make any progress. There's no signal going forward. There's no signal going backwards. So this is kind of basically going to get stuck here. And so render the neuron dead. So sometimes in training neural networks, some, new, some neurons are dead on arrival. And they die during the whole training process. And they kind of bog it down and, and so on. And so basically, by having a skip connection here, it allows us to get over this problem here. We get a signal through the skip connection here as opposed to coming through here. And so this is kind of, uh, we eliminate some singularities. There, there's a whole, as I say, there's a whole bunch of these uh, singularities that people have studied over the years. And so what this paper did was they, they kind of took that uh, view of uh, training a network and, and they noticed that um, the training time um, could be um, reduced dramatically using these uh, hyper-connected networks, basically, uh, as opposed to these plane networks and, and, and so on. And in addition, they looked at the eigenvectors of the Hessian matrices, and they noticed other problems there. And, um, and so there are degenerate eigenvectors, and so the percentage is um, uh, um, um, a bit better for... for uh, so anyway, I guess let me just kind of get to the chase here. So. There's a whole host of characters I should thank for this uh, uh, presentation here. And um, bottom line here is that we are in a position today to spend our time architecting uh, deep networks. It's like wiring a circuit, basically. And I think I've shown you some examples here of where you can get super creative and solve amazing problems. Unfortunately, there's no theory about these type of dense networks. And, uh, and it's largely an empirical sport today. And so my projection is that the biggest, next biggest breakthrough will come by continuing to understand what is the gradient about, what is NABLA about, and how do we get the NABLA through the network and so on. And uh, in, in parallel, we, we still need to work on matrices and we need to educate our students to do better in terms of linear algebra and so on. And so a uh, closing thought here is that here is, um, uh, these disks here correspond to the size of the neural network. Um, that uh, we have to train. And so typically these networks get very big and when they get big, we can solve amazing problems, but they get to be too big. And so when, uh, you know, when we're on our phones, when I say, hey, do you want to download a model that's 100 meg or 100 gig? 100 gig models are not strange today. Uh, if you talk to any of the big uh, companies, you'll see that uh, these networks tend to be super big. And so we, we, uh, we, we want to kind of play uh, at, so for example, um, 
to play uh, a game of Go with AlphaGo back two years ago, it cost $3,000 in electricity. So that's a lot of money to play just a pay for just a game. And so we want to reduce our uh, footprint for uh, networks. Um, and the, the game here uh, is, is, is it's a hardware algorithmic uh, play. Plus, um, so here we've got all these big companies here playing different types of games and hardware. And uh, at the bottom line is that we, um, we also, uh, so basically we're trying to compress our networks more. So here we've got a thing called SqueezeNet, and we can go from um, a, a, a maybe a 100, 100 meg model down to maybe a half a, a meg and accomplish the same thing by doing some creative things about compressing our, our weights and so on. So anyway, um, I guess the bottom line is that um, um, we uh, have come a long way in the last few years, and I think in the next, say, year, or year and a half, we're going to see some amazing progress again because there are so many people working in this space today and there's so many uh, low-hanging fruit out there. And I guess uh, we're hungry for theory at this point. So I'll pause there and take questions. So, so I guess um, when we look at, um, I'll read the question. So, so my understanding of what you said was that there are lots of great uh, optimization theory based algorithms out there, and convex optimization is one of those subfields of optimization theory. And so, so gradient descent is kind of the vanilla uh, approach to doing optimization, I guess. And so people have developed uh, various flavors of gradient descent. Think of Adam, for example, or Nadam, or, or all, all these variations that allow us to go faster and accelerate towards our minimum. And so now you're saying that can we reframe this whole uh, learning experience as a convex optimization problem? And the answer is no, I don't think we can, but so you have an idea about this? Uh, so, okay, so, so generally the, these um, neural networks are not convex. So we can't really take the convex optimization uh, approaches and apply them to these problems. So we have to take this non-convex uh, approach to, to, uh, to solving these problems. And so uh, there has been, in the last, uh, let's say, five years, there have been, um, let's say, at least four or five core algorithms that have been developed to accelerate uh, and to do gradient descent in a more, in a better fashion. So I'm not sure if that kind of helps. Okay. I'm, I'm a computer because I'm not over years ago, I think it's probably the skip method is, is reminiscent of things that you do Um, I guess one tenuous connection is that a lot of machine learners are, are former physicists. So they might be bringing that prior knowledge into the game here. And um, as for the connection between Metropolis Hastings uh, algorithm and skip connections, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure people have viewed it that way so far. I haven't really seen that. I think uh, it would be worth exploring a bit more. So that sounds a very interesting uh, uh, perspective. So, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I'm not very familiar with auto-bit schemes. 
briefly restate what it is that you uh, what the new capability is that it offers were like how can we take this new chain rule to figure out how to set up these systems place that they need to have? So okay, so disclaimer. So we're using back propagation, which is basically uh, a kind of a sugar-coated uh, uh, chain rule application. So basically, we're using the chain rule to unpack the network uh, and, and get at each weight uh, on a layer-by-layer -layer basis. So it's kind of that's chain rule applied repeatedly, uh, recursively, uh, a la back propagation. So then, auto differentiation. Um, it's not a big deal here. It's just always saying, hey, we're just going to take care of uh, doing differentiation in this kind of uh, in this kind of layered architecture type framework. And so we're going to do it automatic f automatically for you. Because back in the old days, you would take uh, a neural network objective function or loss function. You would compute the gradient by hand on paper. And then you would say, OK, now, now let me go to the, to the computer and let me type in the code for the gradient. And you would hope and pray that you didn't make a mistake, because it might take you a while to debug it. And so today, all you got to do is like say, hey, look. Uh, so th there are a couple of things. There's a couple couple of levels of where you can operate today. So the first thing you can say, hey, I'm going to work at the configuration level. I'm going to say, look, I've got a network here. I've got a, an input of say four uh, variables. So it's four, I'm having four four input variables. So I specify. I'm just going to specify the architecture of the network, saying, hey, it's going to be four inputs. I'm going to add a hidden layer with 10 hidden nodes. And then let's say I have the output layer, which is three classes. And so I can specify this architecture at a super high level like this, saying input layer four, uh, hidden layer is, uh, is 10. It's a dense layer, meaning I've got a fully connected uh, layer uh, uh, from every neuron to every neuron between these two uh, layers. And then I'm going to have another dense output layer, which has uh, three neurons. And I'm going to have a logistic loss or cross-entropy type loss function. And so I can just specify that using a, a text file. And so, and so that's kind of, uh, and so, and, and the system, like say TensorFlow or whatever, will take care of the rest and say, okay, thank you for the configuration. I will create the network and I'll figure it all out. Alternatively, you say, okay, well, that's kind of too high level for me. I'd like it down underneath the covers and, and see what's going on there. And so there, you can go in and say, OK, well, um, I'm going to write the network. I'm going to declare that I have four inputs. And then I'm actually going to take a, um, a matrix of weights for my first hidden layer. I'm going to initialize them. I'm, I'm going to find the output layer. And I'm going to have another matrix of weights. And I'm going to multiply my input by that, that, uh, the hidden layer matrix of weights to get a set of activations. Then I'll pass them through this activation function. And then I'll multiply the activations by the, the, the weights associated with my output layer. And then I might compute some, some loss. And so I'll write all those multiplications, those matrix multiplications, by hand in code. So if you think about it as NumPy operations, but let's say NumPy in TensorFlow. Uh, and so, so basically, I'm saying, look, I'm, I'm writing down the equations for the forward propagation. And because I set up my problem in a particular way saying, look, my, my, the first four variables are input variables. And then I've got this matrix. I got two matrices. Those two matrices basically are decision variables. And the TensorFlow system, for example, will know that, oh, I, I understand those guys to be decision variables that I need to optimize on. So, um, so basically, you're telling in the system, you're writing the math equations for the forward prop, and you're saying the role of this uh, variable or this weight uh, or, or matrix is either a decision variable or it's an input variable. If it's a decision variable, it's up for optimization. So we specify the network, we specify how things interact, and then the framework will say, oh, I, I see that you got a network here. I'll take care of the back propagation. Uh, I'll take care of doing gradient descent. When you ask me to do gradient descent, I know what's the decision variable and what's an input variable, and I'll take care of uh, figuring it all out. I'll take care of all that uh, nasty calculus stuff. And uh, so 
that's, a, that's so, so, so there are two different levels at which we operate here, either a configuration file level, uh, like Keras, or we can go low level, like TensorFlow or uh, Torch, or, or, and, and so on. And so does that answer your question? Yeah. So, so I think that um, uh, when it comes to say computer vision, uh, how we architect our networks for doing vision tasks is very much inspired by the human brain and the visual cortex in our brain. So in our visual cortex, um, there have been a number of different studies uh, about how the, the neurons in, in the visual cortex work. And um, um, there are lots of uh, videos online of these experiments that were done back in the late 50s, early 60s, where they tried to understand what was going on in the visual cortex in, in neurons in, in uh, I think it was mice. Um, and um, and so they recognize that neurons in, in, in the visual cortex have different roles. So, so there, there's a kind of a hierarchy of, of neurons. Some of the neurons are kind of low level things that take care of finding edges or boundaries between things. And then there are other neurons which will take care of finding maybe uh, um, substructures and objects like an eye or a nose. And then there are higher order neurons which will take care of recognizing faces or people. And so we were inspired by that. And as a result, we have these convolutional neural networks that have kind of come through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And now we have them as a, as a major uh, style of network for solving vision. So outside of that, I haven't really seen much more inspiration. Uh, this, that's a very clear cut path from biology to, to, uh, to actually um, engineering solutions here um, in a mathematical format. And so I, I don't think I've seen much more. Uh, I, I think there are elements of that around, I guess. Uh, and so, I, you know, we, we still have an amazing brain here. We've got billions of neurons and uh, we're, so I guess people are kind of uh, on a path to see, okay, well, the brain has, I don't know how many billions of neurons, let's say 20 or 30 billion. Uh, and then there's like a, the brain has um, the capability of doing so many, I don't know, teraflops of operations. And so today our hardware is still kind of years away from uh, replicating uh, our brain power. But Sure. So, yeah, so I think today we, um, we have things that do, that do vision. We got things that do speech, we have all these different networks, different architectures. And um, so, so I, I would say that um, the one thing that's kind of interesting that has come out of deep learning is that, um, so previously, if we were trying to solve a problem, we might say, okay, well, let me use module A to do something. Let me use module B to do another thing. So we might have a system that's very heterogeneous in nature. And today with deep learning, we we're in a position where we've got a very homogeneous uh, approach to solving problems. We say, hey, all it is is uh, we have the networks, we have layers, uh, we have back propagation, forward prop, and it's a very homogeneous style of, of, of processing. And so um, that's kind of one big development, I think. So, so if you can understand neural networks and, and back propagation, uh, man, it opens up a whole bunch of opportunity. And so basically, you know, I did my PhD in machine learning and computer vision. Uh, back in the mid 90s, you know, I spent years doing it. Uh, and today I could get my PhD probably in an afternoon uh, or replicate that work in an afternoon or, or maybe go beyond us, way beyond us. So, so we, we've kind of come a long way. And so, so we've kind of learned a lot and we can achieve a lot. Uh, but I'm not sure if, if biology is still driving us uh, as much as... But, I, I think there's definitely no reason why not to look at it more closely. Other questions or anybody on the phone? I realize that we haven't been paying attention to you guys too much, so. 
Go ahead. Well, I think it's good to kind of get out there and try things. Um, and, and so I think the tools are sufficiently easy to go out there and uh, tinker with. Uh, so that's the first thing. I think uh, you don't, know, don't need to know that much to be dangerous, I guess. That's kind of, it's, a very, it's very easy to get going in this. And um, secondly, yeah, if things do fall apart, uh, then you might be lost for a little bit. There's a, there's a, there's a, I think the on-ramp for deep learning is kind of steep. But it's a it's it's a worthwhile venture, I guess. And uh, um, but yeah, I think what you said was kind of accurate. Maybe that it works really well. But if things start to leave the norm, then you are uh, you're probably going to be lost for a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I think on the phone we're going to hang up here. So I'm going to stop recording first.